Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to this um, exciting lecture. Uh, I would like, also like to welcome the um, live stream audience, and I think I cannot resist to say hello to my two sons, <laughs> who are 17 and 12. They are bookworms, so I hope you convince them to keep on reading for the years to come. I'm sure you will. Um, the um, Twitter uh, f f feed for this event is UCLLLHL, and the event code is 8980. Um, our speaker today is Professor Alice Sullivan. Uh, she's a sociologist, and her main research focuses on social educational inequalities. And she's based in the Institute of um, Education. And she is the director of the 1970 British Court Study at the Center of, for Longitudinal Studies. Um, I'll give now uh, the floor to Professor Alice Sullivan to talk about the lifelong benefits of reading for pleasure. Thank you, Anna. So the research I'm going to talk to you about today is about reading for pleasure and learning. So does reading for pleasure influence our learning both during the school years and also um, beyond those school years going into midlife? And the question that we started with um, that drove this research was really, well, we know that bright kids, kids who are able and doing well in school, tend to be more likely to read for pleasure. But is it just that they enjoy reading more because they're bright, or does the reading actually make them learn more quickly and effectively make them brighter and make them do better um, in school and in tests? And then subsequently, we decided to take the research further and to look at whether there was a continuing influence then going into midlife. And so these are the um, two research papers that myself and my colleague, Matt Brown, published um, from this work. And we set out to answer our questions using a study called um, the 1970 British Cohort Study, which is a study of over 17,000 babies who were born in one particular week in 1970. So it's a really powerful study because it's large, it's representative, um, and it's also following people throughout time with very rich information about all the different aspects of their lives. So we followed them from birth and we followed them regularly every few years, and most recently um, in 2012 when they were age 42. And we have a whole wealth of information, so about their socioeconomic circumstances um, into the families where they were born, their own education, a whole range of cognitive test scores that they did at 5, 10, and 16 so that we can track their learning and their development. And then, importantly for this study, we repeated um, the vocabulary tests that they did when they were 16 when they were 42, so we can actually see whether they improved between 16 and 42 and what factors drove who improved and learned more words between those ages um, compared to others. So first of all, let's look at reading at age 10. So the gray lines are uh, reading often, and this is the mother reporting on, yes, my child um, reads um, at age 10, reads books, importantly. Um, so not just reads anything, but reads books. And we've looked at that according to the level of qualifications of the parents. And you can see that, yes, those who, for example, have a parent who has a degree, 72% of them are reading often, compared to 59% of those whose parents have no qualifications. So there is a, there is a gradient there. But overall, th they're reading a lot at age 10. Then at age 16, you see the, the picture changes a bit. So unfortunately, they weren't asked quite the same question, but even so, I think we can see that those reading rarely or never, both that group has gone up, and we can see that there's quite a big educational gradient here. So 
19% of those who had a parent who had a degree were reading rarely or never by age 16, but that goes all the way up to 45% for those whose parents had no qualifications. So almost half of them are now not, um, not reading for pleasure. So something has happened there. But does it matter for their learning? So what we, what we did was we ran a statistical regression analysis accounting for lots of factors in these children's lives so that we could isolate the influence of reading for pleasure. So this is just showing uh, a snapshot, a simplified snapshot of the findings, but we're controlling here for things like the parents' social class, the parents' education and income. We're controlling for the children's test scores at the ages of five and 10. So we're effectively looking at progress between 10 and 16. So essentially, when you're looking at people with similar social backgrounds and similar test scores up to age 10, do those who read more actually make more progress? And we look at both vocabulary here and also mathematics. So vocabulary is the blue lines and mathematics is the orange lines. And you can see clearly that those who've read books often at age 10 um, are making more progress than those who don't. So um, five percentage points more progress in vocabulary, three percentage points more progress in maths. Reading newspapers at 16 and reading books at 16 are also influential. And just to put that in some kind of context, as a sociologist of education, the thing I always expect to make the biggest difference to children's attainment in school is having a highly educated parent. And so we see here the influence of having a parent who has a degree. It's very important, so percent, four percentage point advantage in progress in vocabulary, three percentage point advantage in progress in maths. But it's not as important as reading. So the fact that reading is actually more important than that thing that we always expect to be the most important thing is, is very interesting. And when you take all these uh, reading variables together, um, the cumulative effect is about four times more important than actually having a highly educated parent. So it's quite a, a striking finding. The other thing that people ask me about a lot with this research is, well, okay, I understand why, this, why reading would matter for vocabulary, but why does it matter for maths? And I think the answer to that is that really when people read for pleasure, that yes, they're introduced to new vocabulary, and they're also introduced to new concepts. And that actually helps them to learn across the curriculum rather than just in English. So it, it helps them assimilate new knowledge across the board. So in summary, the answer to the question is, does reading for pleasure matter? Learning during the school years is yes. It matters quite a bit. But then what happens when uh, our school years are very far behind us and somehow we find ourselves middle-aged? Um, are we still learning? Do we, how, do, does our vocabulary improve? Do we still have time to read? What do we read? And does it matter? So uh, is it basically done and dusted? You know, if you're going to have a good vocabulary, it will be determined by age 16. Or does it continue to develop? And does it matter how much you read? And does it matter what you read? So when our, our 1970 cohort members were 42, we asked them a whole range of questions about their reading, not just the amount of reading, but the type of reading that they were doing. So first piece of good news, you, it's not all downhill from age 16. Um, you actually do learn new words, and our cohort members made quite a bit of progress in their vocabulary scores. And actually, the men made a bit more progress than the women. Um, but overall, on average, uh, people's vocabularies improved quite a bit between the ages of 42, so uh, 16 and 42. So they're definitely learning. Do they still have time to read? Well, there's a lot of variability here, but clearly some of them are reading a hell of a lot, um, particularly some of the women. So 34% of the women say that they're reading every day or almost every day compared to 19% of the men. At the other end of the spectrum, of course, there's a lot of people who are barely reading. Um, so 27% of men read less than even once a year, 
for pleasure in their spare time. So there's an enormous variability there, but certainly it's not true that people aren't reading. Then we asked them what they were reading, and I think this is really quite interesting because there's so much variability according to the educational level um, of our respondents. So we actually asked them about their education in quite a bit of detail. So um, you've got the light blue line, there is no qualifications. Orange is below A-level, grey is A-level, yellow is degree, and then the, the dark blue line is Russell Group degrees, so people who have degrees from places like UCL, for example. And we found it quite striking that there's very big differences <coughs> in cultural tastes between those with Russell Group degrees and other degrees. So, for example, uh, if we look at classic fiction, so that would be things like Dickens, Jane Austen, you can see uh, over 40% of those with Russell Group degrees are reading that kind of literature, less than 30% of those with other degrees, and then it goes down to about 10% for people with no qualifications. Even more striking with contemporary literary fiction, so things like um, Salman Rushdie or Angela Carter, that kind of thing. Um, you've got you're approaching half of them from the Russell Group um, universities reading that kind of stuff and about 30% of other, um, other degrees and then going down um, to sort of about 5% of those with no qualifications. And you can see that different genres behave quite differently. So with romance, for example, it's those who with the highest levels of education are least likely to say that they enjoy reading romance. Um, on the other hand, crime is the most popular category regardless of your level of education. So it's the most popular for people with no qualifications. It's also the most popular <coughs> with people with Russell Group degrees. <coughs> so that allowed us to kind of classify um, the kinds of fiction that people were reading into highbrow, lowbrow, and middlebrow so that we could use that in our analysis. And you can see there's a strong education gradient, but very far from deterministic. You know, nearly 20% of those with no qualifications are actually reading highbrow fiction. Then we do a similar thing with factual reading. So what kind of factual reading are people doing? Well, they like cookery books. Um, autobiographies and biographies are interestingly different. Autobiographies, people from all different educational levels like to read them. Biographies are much more popular with the more highly educated. So I think that makes sense if you walk into a bookshop and look at the, the autobiographies and the biographies. Um, but clearly it's categories like history, politics, science, and philosophy that are the most differentiated according to educational level. And so we're able to break it down then in the level of complexity of the kind of reading in order to answer, you know, does it matter um, just that you read or that you're reading more difficult material. So again then, um, this is a very heavily summarized um, snapshot of the results from uh, quite a complex statistical analysis that includes both childhood socioeconomic circumstances, test scores at the ages of 5, 10 and 16, and also of course we're here taking account of the the cohort members' own um, educational and occupational level at 42, because we've seen that obviously those who are more highly educated are more likely to read particular types of books. And so we want to take that into account and say, okay, partialing all of that out, does it matter? Does their childhood reading continue to matter for their vocabulary development between 16 and 42? And does their adult reading matter? And uh, what you can see here is that actually, even though we're controlling for so many different factors, including the test scores at 10 and 16, reading books at 10 and reading books at 16 still continue to have an influence on vocabulary development between um, 16 and 42, which may well be because that's developed good habits, which are then continuing um, into midlife. Reading frequently at age 42 is linked to learning more new words between the ages of 16 and 42. But also, really, it seems to matter quite a bit what you read. Um, highbrow factual leads to more vocabulary development than lowbrow, but highbrow fiction really stands out 
as the place where you're really going to get that new vocabulary, which I think does, it makes sense. Um, we know that uh, books contain far more complex language, typically, than verbal conversations, and we know that different kinds of books have different levels of complexity of language. And so it makes sense that those who are reading highbrow fiction are learning more vocabulary. So why does it matter? Well, I think the, the findings um, that I've presented here really suggest that when we're thinking about children's learning and learning right throughout the life course, it's not enough just to think about the explicit learning that's going on in school, because learning goes on outside of school as well, and reading for pleasure is potentially a huge driver of learning, so we really mustn't neglect it. Um, it's potentially worrying at a time when there are concerns that young people are not reading as much as they used to. They have so many competing demands on their time. How are they going to find the time to read? And if that is the case, then our results suggest that that could have quite serious implications for their learning, for their cognitive development. Another finding that I think is, is well understood by, by teachers and parents is that it's much harder to encourage children to continue to read for pleasure once they're going into the secondary school years. So there's this drop off in reading for pleasure between primary and secondary. So how do we tackle that? How do we help young people through this difficult transition between children's books and going on into adolescent and adult literature and make sure that they actually have access to books and find books that they enjoy reading because this is, of course, about reading for pleasure. So we can't force them to read. It's got to be voluntary and we've got to help them to find books that they like. In addition, it's particularly important to help children who come from homes that don't have lots of books and don't have highly educated parents because we know that those are the children that are going to be less likely to be reading for pleasure. And yet this is a tool that potentially um, could be helping them to close the gap. And finally, our findings suggest that actually it's not enough to encourage people to read. It does matter what they're reading. And so we do need to be challenging and helping people to develop towards that more intellectually challenging material and more difficult fiction in particular. So um, I do think the findings are important and um, it's really great to be able to get the findings out there and um, talk to audiences like yourselves. And I've written a couple of um, short articles on the findings to, to try and help that process. And it's been really heartening that we've had a lot of interest in these findings from um, teachers, librarians, policymakers, and others. And we've put together um, an impact study on that. So hopefully the, the research could have some influence in terms of policy. Finally, um, I think it's really important to thank the 1970 birth cohort study members. They, um, as I've said, they were born into the study. They didn't sort of initially choose to be in it. And many thousands of them are still taking part, which is really quite amazingly generous of them um, to still continue to do this. Um, and obviously it allows us to produce research, not just on this topic, but on a huge range of topics across the social and health sciences. And hopefully, we'll still be tracking them for many, many years to come, and we'll be able to look, for example, at the influence of reading on their cognitive performance as they go into their older years. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, we can take questions from the audience, and we'll also be taking questions from um, virtual questions. So, yep. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, do, I, I hope this isn't too off topic, but uh, reading is a, a very solitary uh, mm. activity and it's sort of immersion in the text. Yeah. And that's how we get out of the vocabulary and the grammar. 
as well. Mm. Do, do you have anything to say to uh, immersion in the oral text? So, especially aesthetic, storytelling in the beginning, and then going on to uh, the talking books, where it's often a communal activity that everyone read. Uh, it's almost a sort of reading with your ears. Mm. Is that, uh, does that have any impact? I mean, do you have anything on that? So, we don't have anything on that. And obviously, for this generation, when they were younger, they wouldn't have necessarily had access to that kind of technology, although they would potentially now. I think those, those kinds of tools are potentially incredibly useful, especially if they get people into reading. So I think it's possibly unlikely that you'd get quite the same influence on learning as you would from being immersed in a text, um, as you said. But if, they, if those kinds of tools can get people into reading, then I think that's potentially very important. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, did your study um, come across the important, importance of parents reading to their kids before they could read? Because there's a lot about that, isn't there? How, you know, how, how important is that, basically? Yeah, yeah. So that is one of the factors that we included in our modelling. So obviously it didn't show you the full set of results. But that is clearly, that's an influential factor. Um, the child's own reading matters above and beyond that. But of course, having a parent that reads to you is likely to encourage you to read yourself. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's been shown as a huge factor, but I think uh, very many studies, so yeah, very, very important. Mm. Hello, thank you. I'm asking a question on behalf of our slido.com audience, event code 8980, if anyone's listening at home. Uh, one of the questions is around, uh, I don't know if this is part of your study, but have you found any relationships um, between the amount of time reading um, or the type of literature and IQ measures? So, um, the, the kind of cognitive test scores that we have in this study aren't strictly speaking IQ measures, but they, those kinds of different types of cognitive measures tend to be quite highly correlated. So, although we don't have IQ strictly speaking, um, my, my guess would be that, it, that the results would probably be similar. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to ask uh, more about arithmetics mm -hmm. and whether you investigated that people, for example, who don't read, but they do sort of like puzzles and work on that, that could be interesting to see because their literacy skills may be as high, although they don't read for pleasure, but they do puzzles mm -hmm. and they like like short tasks and they do mathematical problems. and. I just wonder if you have any insights on that part of brain development. So we didn't look at puzzles. The other activity that we did look at was playing a musical instrument because we thought that um, to some extent reading for pleasure may reflect being in a certain type of home with a certain level of cultural capital. And so we wanted to sort of test for that by putting in playing a musical instrument to see whether the effect was similar as you might expect if it's just about cultural capital or very different as you'd expect if you think it's actually about being exposed to words and ideas. And actually what we found was that playing a musical instrument didn't have an influence on um, cognitive development over time. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you say about puzzles and other activities is interesting. So possibly something to pursue for future studies. Uh, have you been able to, in your study, to look at how reading for pleasure affects um, other factors such as um, mental health and uh, yeah, quality of life, things like that? I think that's, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, I haven't. It's something I'd really like to do, I think, uh, it, yeah, I think there's there's a clear hypothesis there that you know having that kind of 
ability to escape from reality, if you like, without resorting to drink or drugs or <laughs> other kinds of potentially damaging things could be, um, could be protective. So I, th I think, and we have very good mental health measures over the life course. So it's certainly something that we could look at in the future. Um, could you comment on the horror category and education level? Gosh, uh, I'm going to have to go back to that because... It was interesting because it was different. <coughs> yeah, there. Okay. So people with lower levels of qualifications are more likely to enjoy horror. Yeah. Is, does that surprise you? <laughs> I, uh, I never thought about it. So I was surprised because of that it's different to the other trends, for example. I mean, my question is, yeah, yeah why, so why might that be? Maybe horror for men is like what romance is for women. <laughs> <laughs> mm. The similar trend. But I would yeah. have to break it down by yeah. gender to check that out. Yeah, I mean, the trend is similar for horror and romance. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, it would be interesting if you did break it down by gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good yeah. point. Thank you. Thank you. I was surprised that there was a difference between the reading of fiction and the reading of, let's say, quality newspapers or periodicals or reading around politics. Do you, did you understand, did you come to understand why it was something very specific about fiction? That made the difference? So why highbrow fiction in particular? Um, I mean, I, highbrow factual is also positive, but just not as positive as highbrow fiction. Um, I think it may just be, because we are looking specifically at, at vocabulary at 42, it may just be that you get a wider range of words that are used in fiction than in factual writing, um, <coughs> which I think, I think does make sense in that in factual writing, perhaps if you do get unusual words, maybe it's more specific to that particular technical discipline, whereas in fiction, it'll be more general. So that could possibly be it. Thank you. Uh, two more online questions here. I'll ask them at the same time. Uh, the first one is, uh, is poetry a separate reading skill to fiction? And uh, the second one is around initiatives and school timetables, um, <coughs> excuse me, to, to put reading for pleasure into the school timetable, or is that more of a parental responsibility? Yeah, is reading poetry a separate thing? Well. Uh, reading poetry, you can see it's not very popular among our 42-year-olds, uh, which isn't that surprising. I think, yeah, that's, but there probably is a lot in that, that it's a very separate kind of experience um, from, from reading novels. Um, but we, we treated it as a form of fiction here rather than as a separate thing. Um, in terms of whether reading for pleasure could be scheduled into the school curriculum, I think that's a really difficult one because at that point, does it stop being reading for pleasure because you're kind of being forced to do it? Um, and then it becomes a very different thing. I think, you know, well, in primary schools, of course, often you have the kind of silent reading period, and I think that does develop useful habits of kind of solitary reading. Um, so yeah, potentially allowing a space for this in schools could, could be valuable. I think also schools need to think about the demands on young people's time. Of course, the, the demands on their time doesn't just come from school, but if you've got, you know, you get home and you've got a huge amount of homework, you're probably then potentially not going to have time to read for pleasure as well. And so you may be getting some gains from the homework, but you may also be losing something. So I think that has to be taken into account. Um, did you also look at uh, social skills related to the amount of reading? Because since it's a really solitary activity, maybe, I don't know, it had an influence? 
That's a good point. No, we didn't, we didn't look at that. Um, and it's, yeah, it's potentially related in that people who are more um, introverted, maybe also more attracted to reading, but I guess potentially reading could, could make you less, uh, less prone to kind of develop social skills. So yeah, I think um, alongside the other, the other comment about mental health, I guess that's the flip side of the coin, that um, reading could be protective in giving you an escape from negative social interactions potentially, but on the other hand, by allowing you to run away from social interactions, could it potentially be damaging? So I think, again, yeah, that would be really interesting to look at in the future. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, interesting talk, thank you. Um, I, I work in schools every day, and when I'm working with children to try to get them to write, I always find that those that don't read, well, generally, those that don't read uh, obviously struggle with the vocabulary, and they've got limited vocabulary and limited word choices, but they've also got very, very limited imagination. Mm. Uh, did you in any way correlate imagination um, to, to your results as well? So it's very hard it's to hard measure. It's hard, hard to measure, measure imagination, imagination, imagination through multiple that. choice tests, which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is what we're using here. But I, I mean, I'm sure you're right. So I, th I think what I'm getting at is yeah. kind of the way that you're developing a mind, and as the vocabulary is developing, if your imagination is developing with it, as you said, reading cuts right across the curriculum, not just yeah. um, English. And it's developing that out of the box thinking. And we need a vocabulary and ability to push boundaries, which fictional reading in particular, which perhaps your study does show, um, we, we need that to be able to do it. Yes, I think without the words, you don't have the concepts. And so the whole thing is tied together. I absolutely agree. Mm. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, the, the study is based on self-reporting, as I understand it, yes. of levels of reading and yeah. um, what sort of reading you do. Have yeah. you any view on the accuracy of the self-reporting? So I think that's that's a good point. Um, do so the, the problem would be if people with bigger vocabularies overstate their reading because they feel like they're the sort of people who should be reading a lot, and therefore they say that they are. Um, very difficult to kind of get around that. I guess you could go into people's homes and actually look at what books are in there. That would be, a, that would be really nice, but um, maybe a slightly intrusive. <laughs> so we've never done that. I mean, I, I agree that it's potentially an issue, but I guess, uh, I guess I'm not hugely worried by it. Um, I think, yes, there may be a certain amount of over-reporting in terms of seeing it as socially desirable. Um, but yeah, on the whole, I don't think there's necessarily huge motivation to, to misreport reading behavior. Yeah. So I'm interested in what the access to literature is for, for, pe for kids and for, for people in the context of libraries because reading can be a very expensive habit mm. and so if what we're trying to do is increase people's reading for pleasure without doing it in schools is there any way in which this research is fed into the um, campaigns to keep libraries open or yes. that kind yeah. of thing I'm interested to know how that interaction has happened if it has yes it, it has and this research has been picked up quite a lot by libraries and people campaigning for libraries I think, um, I mean, libraries and librarians are absolutely vital in providing not just access to books, but are also helping children to find the books that they're going to enjoy reading, because that's actually not a completely straightforward thing, and it's particularly not straightforward, as I've talked about, when you're making that transition to, from primary to secondary school. So, yeah, it's really, really worrying that so many schools nowadays don't have libraries and don't have librarians, um, and that so many libraries are closing. And of course we do, uh, we have great access to books through technology, through Kindles and so on, but that needs to be made available and you do also need that human dimension to actually help people find what's out there. Yeah. Do you have time for one more? 
time for questions. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, do you, do you or your colleague from IOE uh, carry out the, any research about the reading habit uh, was born in min millennium, so we can compare the, the 16, uh, uh, 16, age, 16 years old group to the uh, 1970 cohort? So, yeah, good question. So the millennium cohort study is obviously a, a kind of similar study following children up who were born in 2000, and they um, have, I think, been asked about, I hope, been asked about their reading habits in the last wave. And so uh, there's definitely scope to do research to compare the two, uh, which I think is, is really, really important. We need to find out to what extent kids are still reading today and, and how that's affecting their learning. Predictions? My guess is they're probably reading fewer books. Yeah, because they're both, they have much more demanding time at school, homework, etc., but also social media. Um, on, the, on, the, on the other side, they kind of leave the house less. So <laughs> that might, that could push in the other direction. But um, in general, I think my prediction would be that they're probably reading less, but it's really important to find that out. Um, and when we were growing up and um, as teenagers, there wasn't that teenager fiction genre right. which exists now. So is there a difference between what teenagers are reading now and what was in your study? Yeah, I think that's, that is a good point. There probably is more for them to read without having to make that difficult jump between the children's and the adult section with just, uh, just a few... Judy Blooms or whatever to tide you over in between. There's probably a lot more in that in between category now. So that, that could be a strong positive. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, there is one there. Um, hi, I was just wondering, are there any other actual benefits of reading for pleasure apart from vocabulary on people over 16? Like any other proven other benefits? Uh, so, proven benefits, no, but I think, uh, well, this is the outcome that we looked at, and as other people have raised, I think there's scope to look at both other kinds of outcomes, but also to look at a wider range of cognitive um, scores. So, they only did this vocabulary test at age 42. Um, as they are 46 now, we're currently in the field with them doing a biomedical wave. So we have a different set of cognitive tests that are more to do with um, early cognitive decline, so testing memory and a range of other cognitive skills. So it will be possible to look at whether reading is also linked to those factors rather than just vocabulary. Yeah. Okay, there is one over there. Thank you. Um, I was curious about whether reading habits change over life course. So do readers remain readers if you get them at age 10 or 16 reading? So that's a really good question. Um, obviously, there is a link between reading early and continuing to, do, to read. Um, but also, you do see change over time. So far more children at 10 are reading than are reading at 16. So people can drop in and drop out. And I think understanding what we can do to make sure that, the, that there are more people dropping in than dropping out is, is really important. Any more questions? OK. Yeah. I was just wondering, were there any patterns in the types of people who were sort of lost to follow up? Um, by the time they got to the 40, uh, point at, at age 42? Uh, yes, so um, there's been quite a lot of work on differential attrition in the birth cohort studies because obviously it's, it's an important factor for us to take into account. Um, the biggest difference is that it's harder to keep men in the study 
so the, the study becomes more female um, as it gets older. Um, but broadly, it is still reasonably representative of the general population of people born in 1970. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I think we have to, <laughs> to leave the room. There's going to be a, a lecture at one. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for all the very interesting and many questions. <laughs>